This is channeled from Mary Magdalene. Ah, oh, my friends, my brothers and sisters, I'm gonna to begin today by saying, I've known you for so long, and I'm so grateful for those that remember me the way I am. I am your friend, Mary. I've always been here to help, and I want to start first in gratitude, saying thank you for those of you who are talking to me. I am bringing back the divine feminine, as you like to call it on earth, because the survival is coming to an end and the creation is coming back. We have shown Rachel today that our two speakers today are the Marys, myself, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, mother of Jesus. I'm going to start by saying the matrix you live in is such a beautiful texture of fabric. I watch it weave and grow every day. As I look upon this tapestry, there are threads pointing upward. Those threads are unfinished tasks that have been left open purposefully throughout the generations. Those of you listening to this message, you're hearing this on purpose because you have something to do with those strings, those tasks. In the quiet heart of Iowa, a young girl looked at the world and saw more than most of us ever could. She saw light where there was none, felt spirits that others couldn't, and sensed the presence of angels who whispered truths too ethereal for ordinary ears. Rachel Corpus grew up surrounded by the music of the universe, a symphony that was both beautiful and at times overwhelming. Like so many who possess gifts beyond the veil, she learned to suppress them, to fit in, to seem like everyone else. But life, in its wisdom, had other plans for her. Through life's many challenges, loss, hardship, struggles with mental health, Rachel rediscovered not only her gifts, but also the deep divine truth about who she was. She became a channeler, a bridge between our world and the unseen realms. Today, Rachel communicates with the collective, a vast and loving group of angels, ascended masters and souls, each eager to share wisdom and healing. Her work is a reminder that we are all part of something much greater. And if we choose to access and have divine gifts waiting to be unlocked, today Rachel is with us to share her journey her wisdom, and possibly channel insights directly from the collective. Rachel, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Oh, thank you, Peter. It's so nice to see you again and so lovely to be in your presence and to join your audience. It's such an honor and a privilege to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Can you describe the seeds you have planted, the weeds you have pulled, and the flowers that have bloomed? That's a big, beautiful question. I would say dancing between, moving between the human experience and the spirit experience has been something that has been both a blessing and big challenge throughout this lifetime. The seeds that have been planted, I can recognize now looking back that I planted a lot of those seeds before I was born as Rachel, because they're starting to become shown to me, or sometimes I can become aware of them in my own meditations or just stumble across them in life. And I'm talking about life purpose, why I'm here. The weeds to be pulled. Oh, wow. I wonder if people can relate to this. Growing up in the most perfectly imperfect household that I chose with all the religion and the dysfunction, everything that happened to me in my childhood and young adult years, I'm still pulling those weeds up. But the thing is I notice about weeds, I'm not a gardener. I wish I was a gardener. Oh, I'd love to be a gardener. But something <laughs> I notice about weeds is I never know if it's a weed or if it's a flower because they're both so beautiful. I've come to appreciate that when I pull up the weeds from my childhood, I don't have to see them as something that is taking over me. It's not an infestation like a weed might be. It is, oh, I chose this gift and I can be in control of this because, for instance, limiting beliefs of my parents. I learned those limiting beliefs being their child. I don't like that as the human in me. I don't like that at all. And I work on those things all the time. My kids mirror that back to me in unpleasant ways. Not fun. But when I do my own work, 
I can hold those weeds in my heart and I can say, I chose that. What are the lessons? Was I here for them? Are they here for me? Is it both? Then I get to decide, what do I do with those weeds? Do I say gently to them, I'm going to see you in the afterlife. I don't need you anymore, but I'm going to integrate the learning. The blessing comes forth. The flower can bloom because the weed is out of the way. Or do I let it keep growing there because I'm not quite ready to deal with it? Sometimes the weeds just keep growing. You pull it up and next season you're like, oh, you're here again. Limiting beliefs, childhood gunk. We all have weeds in our life, but one of the key things in life is you have to turn over the soil and cultivate (laughs) the soil for skills to take root so those flowers Mm -hmm. can bloom you can experience the achievements or qualities that you can look back at and that you're proud of it's like growing a vine you need good terroir good Mm -hmm. solid earth nutritious earth i want to talk about embracing the divine within because there are many others who experience extraordinary spiritual gifts and i know in your early years you try to surpass them But life led you back through hardship and personal evolution. You discovered your journey was not about hiding, but about embracing the divine essence within you. In a world where many feel disconnected from divinity, your story is profoundly inspiring. Was there a moment or a rising realization or an experience or a period in your life when you've decided to embrace your spiritual gifts fully? My spiritual gifts, my angel form, it feels like it's right beneath my skin all the time. This Rachel body is like a cardigan over it. When I was a child, I would even catch myself in the mirror sometimes shiny white and it would startle me. I would look down and I'd brush my teeth, not looking at the mirror. And then I'd peek up and look like myself again. I would have these things that would come through or I would go to mass with my parents because my parents were Catholic and we would have the Jesus on the crucifix. That's not the Jesus that I knew that I talked to all the time. The Jesus I knew had blue jeans on and a button down shirt and tennis shoes and would sit with me and say, you know, that's not really what happened, right? Let me tell you the real story. So I would stare at this crucifix and then it would flash to healthy Jesus, like leaning on the cross. I'm all right now, but I'm all right. Things like that would happen to me. Also, I would be sitting in class as an elementary student. I was never very good at some subjects in school, but in other subjects, I could look down and complete a worksheet because in my mind, we'd already done it the day before I time traveled. I would already know what the teacher was saying. I could hear inside her mind, or I knew if she was going to have a baby. Those things were always there. That's just the way I lived. But as you're speaking to, as I was getting older in junior high years, I didn't want to be different. I started to realize that what I was experiencing wasn't the same as what everyone else was experiencing. And I was starting to verbalize it more. Oh, do you know so-and-so is pregnant? Oh, she hasn't told anyone yet. How did you know? Or how do you look when you brush your teeth? Does your light body come out? what is a light body? I was on a different matrix. So I started to fold it in and it really felt like this light body was beginning to fold in like accordion doors and come in and fold inside into my sternum, my Christ consciousness. I knew it was there because it would peek out sometimes when I was not managing it, be my birthday or something, or I would be playing with my dogs or something like that. There it is. There are a few pictures of me out there where you can see it. I'm not in the picture, but it's just my light. It's really neat. I did keep it folded in really as long as I could because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't want to be judged until I went to the seasons of my life where the hard stuff really began. We're talking about loss of babies. I went through a divorce, uh, deep depression, alcoholism. Talk about human experience. I signed up for a lot of it. When I asked my angels, why? They said, how could you come here to help if you don't know what it's like? You signed up for all of this, including knowing your beautiful parents, including all of the good things, all of the bad things. And they said, hey, what about this? What if we don't call it good and bad? What if we just call it neutral? What if we call it just your experience and you are able to glean whatever you wanted to glean from it? When I started to think about it that way, that's when my gifts started to come out. Because I didn't see it with the lens of, oh, this is scary or something bad's going to happen to me. I made a deal with God and I said, counting on you, whether you are 
God personified, like you were when I was growing up, or if you're energy God, which is what I believe now, I know you can hear me in some capacity and I'm willing. So basically I was like, prove it, God, prove it. And God did. I got fired from a major church that I worked for. (laughs) This is how God was proving himself, herself to me, itself. Got fired from working in a religious church because I was spiritual and went to work for a spiritual church, Unity Church, wonderful place to worship if you're into spiritualism. Absolutely wonderful. Great experience there. As I progressed through that, I realized God is still bigger. I still get to know God bigger. Source. Get to know source bigger. My filter kept changing and my filter was going more toward self-love. I realized I never learned how to love myself. I was taught to please other people. I was taught to fit in, to make deadlines. I was a pleaser. Even now, I could tell you, Peter, I love my children so much, but they will come to my room at 1030 at night and say, mom, can you wash this sweatshirt? What do you think? I say, (laughs) yes, of course I will. I'll be up at 2 a.m. waiting for that dryer to be done. I'm still a pleaser, but more selectively, I would say. But when I took the lens of not needing to please anyone and fear off, my light came back out. You can look at me. I'm integrated. It's not like a superhero movie. Nobody needs that. I could be your neighbor. I could be your sister. Everybody has this light in them. We've just forgotten because we've had so many incarnations where authority figures have told us to survive here, you need to stand in the line this way, be this way, wear this outfit, be quiet, speak when spoken to, believe this. And because we are people who please, we say, okay, tell me more. Tell me what else. And if I do this, you'll pay me. Oh, there's a payoff. Okay. And we start to fall in line and we're breaking from that, aren't we? We really are. Yeah, many people have to work very hard to not let their lights grow dim. I'm curious about the significance of the role of hardship in awakening your connection to the divine. What what was the role of hardship in awakening your connection to the divine? I I wish I could say that it didn't have its part because I want to say to people, It can be so light and easy. I want to say that. I don't personally believe that. I believe that we get to have a connection with the dark because it helps us know our wholeness. With the angels, there is no positive or negative. It's all good. It's all vibrating to serve us. My connection to the dark was deep depression. I would call it dark night of the soul, but my dark night was years I almost lost my life. I was in bed for about two years with an ongoing migraine and deep depression. This was when my children were really little. And of course, the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with me. I was having seizures and some stroke-like behavior, but still nothing was showing up. I knew this was probably spiritual, but I really wanted a doctor to say, here's the pill. I just wanted that so bad, but it wasn't. But what I did get is I learned how to receive help. The people around me who had not always been there for me, they learned how to be there for me. That was good. And also in those really dark moments, which could be at noon when the sun is out, still very dark moments. I got to be with just me and source and figure out what that was like for me. My house looked like an episode of Hoarders. It was bad. And it was probably the start of my alcoholism way back then. This is probably 2006 or 2007. And Jesus sat by me. This part was a dream, but probably true. Jesus sat by me and said, you're never alone. And no one is ever alone. He called it the big joke. And I said, what's so funny about it? And he said, not that kind of joke. It's more of a ruse that you're here and you think you have to struggle so much to find me to find love. And I said to him, I don't want to offend you, but I'm not really into you, Jesus. I really would like to go right to the source. And he said, Hey, I'm just here as a friend. We've had lifetimes together. I'm just here as a friend. I'll go. If you want me to go, I'm like, you can stay. He said, all of you who are here on earth right now, you're here to be in bed with the dark. I was covers up, not showered for days, not eating really on death's door. He said, we're all going to do that in our own way, whether that's physical or emotional or both. We'll all have those times because in those times, that's when you're closest to your own spirit. I was so close to my own spirit. I could resonate with God. God was right there or source. That was my way back up. It felt like I was jacking the beanstalk and climbing the vine back up. Honestly, things got better after that. 
I still had life happen. I lost another child after that pregnancy. My marriage was in really bad shape. We're great now, but it was hard then. We had money issues and lived next door to my parents. I'm just going to let that one stay there. That was difficult. It was like... We have a show here in the States that we used to play called Everybody Loves Raymond, where the family yeah. lived next. It was very much like that. It allowed this cracking open that I realized there's more to me. And I had been all sewn up. My costume was all sewn up tight. This is who Rachel is, period. No, that darkness let me take that away, unravel it, look at the guts and do that dark work. If I were to do it over again, I would engage more therapy because I, I wasn't as spiritual then. I would get outside more. I would eat better. I would pray more. There's things I would add now. On the other hand, everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. I thought, yeah, that was a pretty dark time. Dark nights of the soul. You know, they can be a week. They can be two years. Have you ever had a dark night of the soul, Peter? Oh, many. The challenges were placed before me to give me the choice to surrender to a higher purpose. Wow. That's the gift God's given us, is the yes and the no. A dog can only walk its territory, procreate. I haven't seen a dog play Mozart. So right. we have that gift of the yes and the no, the free will, to make mm -hmm. those choices. In the context of spirituality, it's not all love and light and rose-tinted spectacles. It's been a journey where I've had to go into the rough and tumble of yes. my psyche and my life, question things, learn, unlearn, relearn, align, and make that part of my basic constitution. I had many old winter coats I had to throw off to feel a little bit lighter. That old uh, winter coat gave me uh, blind limbs and bifurcated yeah. paradigms. I was on a bridge between two worlds where... There was the traditional of you go to a school, you follow a curriculum, you fulfill the economic imperative. It's like the white picket fence, the short version. Right. But on the other side of the bridge, there's a whole new world here, unexplored continent. How do I start cultivating the soil for these new skills to take root? It was propelling and organizing me because I was younger at the time and it was sex, drugs and rock and roll, man. Absolutely. Uh, that was Human kind experience. Of, that was it for me. I got married at 17. I got married to a lady in the U.S. Navy. I met here and I lived in the States and it was great, especially when you were mixing with all the U.S. Navy and Marines. It was right, just a crazy quite... party time. And we used to go to the PX store and buy quarts of vodka. And I loved it. But something in me fell into the victim mentality. It was the big violin solo, but I realized the antidote was to become a creator. Yes, because you were creating no matter what. You realized you were the creator. Hindsight's a great thing, but without foresight and insight, it's just hindsight. I recognize I am a replay of the core of creation, so it can find its way through each one of us. I'm attempting, and I say attempt because it is an attempt. I don't have the descriptive language it's to say hey no one's got my fingerprint no one's got my dna am i then a replay of the core of something much higher than me whereby it enables me to be the agency of amplification to be fully self-expressed so i'm no longer looking at the frame i'm moving through the frame into the unknown that's not an easy journey no it's not and when you're on that journey, even though you have people who are spiritual and people who are supporting you, it is your journey. You are on it alone. One of the signs my angels give me is the Madonna song, Like a Prayer. They send that to me all the time. Since I was a child, I don't know when it came out, probably the 80s. After it came out, they started to send that to me in my mind. And now I'll wake up to it sometimes. I've asked them what that means. And it's what you're saying. It's our journey. It's a reminder from them that we're the outward showing. It's like we're source with skin on and we get to show that and amplify. And then I'm noticing as you're talking and I'm seeing, is it okay if I channel a little bit? Are you okay with that? Because I already did. I didn't mean to. Sometimes being an angel, you just do it. I notice as you're talking, your aura begins to pixelate on the outside. And I was watching it. I had to look away so I could see it go over here. But as I was watching it pixelate, it moved into 
archaic coding and it moved back into source. As we all experience our personal experiences, we're not only showing what source looks like to everyone else, but we're also uploading back to source. So source apparently grows. We're expanding source, which is way different than what we're told in a religious context. God is sovereign. God never changes. Here's God. Now, when you're worthy enough, you will be able to get closer and closer to God every millennia. No, that's different. You are already God. You are one with God. You're made of God's parts. I just wanted to reflect that back to you because what you're saying is so spot on. I could see it pixelating back. Very cool. Thank you for that reflection. I mentioned that I no longer see myself as a victim. And I would surmise that you no longer see yourself as a victim, but as a creator. How does that shift in perspective shape the way you view life struggles now? I'm going to bravely say, I really mean this. I'm at a point where I don't feel any struggles. I have moments. I have moments where I will be fully human and they're the oh shit moments or better check that bank account moment or we better check the oil before we go on this big trip moments. I have human moments, but there is nothing that can sway me. Let me flip that coin. The challenge with that is that all around me, here's my path. I no longer struggle with any form of judgment. I'm just with it. It's part of my experience. So here I am, but over here, someone's just lost their mother. So I'm still holding space for them. And I'm just staying neutral because what I want to say is they're back with God. Can I talk to my mom in heaven? Yes, you can. And so the mother will come through and say, oh, it's lovely here. I'm with the family. This is what my welcome party was, my life review. Yes. But that's one part of their mother. What's really going on is they've gone back to source, but people are not always ready to know that part yet, that we are so much bigger than this costume we had on. So I guess what I'm saying is when I'm in my journey, the challenge can be being with other people, holding space for other people. I don't want to say that they're not where I am because I don't mean that at all. I just mean honoring where they are and asking spirit, how do I thread into their life? Are they here to teach me something? Am I here to teach them something? Am I just the observer? Am I the participant? Once you know that this earth experience is fully creatable and that it is a divine matrix that the consciousness is creating, that love is the highest frequency possible and you can create literally anything, bring anything to you. You are source. You're one with source. Everything changes. But that's not what we teach each other, at least not in my culture. In Des Moines, Iowa, that's not what we typically talk about. Will we get there? Yes. I see it. I think Mm -hmm. that's why children are being born differently. I think that's why the school system doesn't work because kids are coming in already aware something fuller for me. There's something bigger for me. And the juxtaposition is they don't know what it is. They don't know how to articulate it. Teachers don't know how to teach it. But I, I feel that with them because as children are navigating, how do I open this world up now that I'm here? How do I fulfill my purpose? I'm here in my lane. Like I see you over there, honey. I see you, kiddo. Come on over. Let's work together. So I know there's some great collaboration that will happen, but yeah, that's the flip side of my coin. I don't see struggle anymore as struggle. It's just, here we are. I'll see how this episode plays out today. The flip side is, how do I live that way and still stay grounded? That's the challenge. I totally resonate with that. And as I mentioned to you when we met, I love ancient things. I love astronomy and astrology from the standpoint of it being a cosmic blueprint of your soul as distinct from just your sun sign. In the cosmic dance of death and rebirth, the universe, the cosmos and life on earth revolves around cycles of death and rebirth. These are represented in many myths like Persephone's descent into the underworld as Uh the phoenix rises from the ashes. Mm. Astrologically, this theme is reflected in the planet Pluto, which governs transformation and regeneration and the crossing between life and death. You mentioned your near-death experience, and I see that's akin to the mystic journey of the soul's descent and return, the crossing of thresholds that has empowered your gifts. And much like Persephone's journey to and from the underworld, which is central to Greek mythology, represents the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. 
The myth explains the seasons because Persephone's time in the underworld, autumn and winter, or fall and winter, symbolizes death and dormancy. But her return to Earth symbolizes or represents spring and summer or renewal, fertility and growth. How is your spiritual journey reflected this cosmic cycle of death, transformation and rebirth? Hmm. I do have cosmic cycles in my life. I have seven year cycles that I've noticed when I was in the working world about every seven years, there would be a great transition. There would be a, a death, a change and a rebirth. I noticed that I have a spiritual rhythm that seems to be, I will receive a, a new lesson, something new from spirit. They'll really offer that to me and saturate my world with it. Then the pattern is go into rest. And it's almost like I don't feel spiritual for a while. That might be my dormancy because what's going on is going into the layers of me that used to be my subconscious programming or still are my subconscious programming. I find that just as in my earth life in the winter months, when we need to be inside, at least here in Iowa, because the weather is so cold, we either choose to sit in front of the TV with our eyes glued and do nothing, or we can challenge ourselves to make it cozy and bake and create and paint. I find when I go into a spiritual dormancy, that's when I create art. I have a lot of intuitive paintings around that are just for me. My family likes them. But I notice that those cosmic rhythms come into us as well. Just like in my human body, I'm menopausal now, but I used to menstruate, right? That's a beautiful rhythm that brought life into the earth. I'm glad I don't have it anymore, but <laughs> I used to have that. That's a beautiful rhythm. And I knew when it was coming and I knew when it was passing. Having babies, so many beautiful rhythms. The hard thing right now is Mama Earth is changing her rhythm. She's waking up and when I channel her, it's not that she doesn't know how to do it. It's just been 26,000 years since she's moved in this way. We have the movement of tectonic plates, the physical movement of the earth, and it, the vibration of that is moving us. Our spiritual rhythms are changing, adjusting. And we're getting the cosmic rhythms, cosmic nudges, but it feels like we don't know if we're coming or going sometimes. So of those seasons of rest, if we go with Persephone into the underworld, there was a lot of time in there where she was just walking and, and looking around. What is this place? It's all very gray and dark. And she was challenged not to see it in fear. It was just where she was. And when she came back out into the spring and summer, she had a renewed value for life. I find that if anything is happening right now with me, it's a renewed value for this beautiful earth because people think it's really going downhill. Oh my gosh, the opposite. Oh, wow. It's just opening up. We're here. The thousand years of peace is here. It's just beginning. Here's my question for you. How do you think people feel cosmic rhythms? It depends on whether their antenna is up. Yeah, that's true. In the old days, you had the aerial on your car on the outside. Yes. And if you drove yeah. under a bridge, you'd get. Uh -huh. And I think with, <laughs> with all the signals that we have now, Wi-Fi, Admiralty signals and CB radio, that warps our electromagnetic mm -hmm. system to feel those cosmic rhythms. For me, especially if I'm out in nature, or even if I'm quietly watching the sway of the trees, listening to the bird song, going for a walk, or even when I go running in nature, because I feel the movement. It's like something is propelling and organizing energy. It's like the establishment of a ever ready media that is like two way traffic between yeah. the earthly terminal point and the vine of creation. There's a radiation that goes up and down that vine of creation. That's the way I experience it. It's like an orchestra where each person in the warm up in an orchestra are tuning their instruments. And it can sound like this whole cacophony of sound that isn't harmonious at all. Then the conductor comes along with his baton and goes tap. They all come together 
in harmony yes. and in cooperation and collaboration, there's a melody that is harmonious because the conductor is like the soul. It's the semiconductor on behalf of the universe coming through to say yes. things come together. Otherwise, the flip side is bifurcation of energy where you are lost in the machinery of distraction of Hollywood celebrity and who's up mm -hmm. who and the latest soap opera. Don't get me wrong. But it's it has like, its place. It has its place. In the vast expanse of the cosmos, I had a direct experience of this, but a particular guest I spoke to, the experience she had was there was a collective extraterrestrial beings she mm -hmm. was channeling. I can't remember if we spoke about, is it Sarai? Sarai, yes. Sarai. The fact that Sarai reaches out to humanity, yes. as did this other guest I, I spoke to some time ago, that channeled message, their message that's channeled through you has sparked my curiosity. What exactly is the nature of this communication and how does it fit into our understanding of extraterrestrial contact? So what are your thoughts on the concept of channeled messages? It's not a concept to you, it's a reality. I love it. First thing that comes to mind is staying in neutrality and receiving the message purely because when channeling any being, any entity, any person, our ego can get in the way and we can filter, mm. add what the article we read, we can add our fear, we can try to finish their sentences, things like that. And we're not supposed to we just say neutral, unless there are times that I'm talking with Sarai and it's a conversation, but then there are other times I'm quiet and they want me to listen. I know that's a challenge. Some of the messages that are channeled that I listen to on some program, they will deeply resonate with truth. They have the vibrational frequency of truth. I can see it. I can feel it. I can feel it wobble a little bit. I can feel and see when the message starts to go into fear or it's been integrated with something false, it's interesting that there's been less of that filtering lately. The messages have been more and more pure, which tells me that our consciousness is raising. And also the veil is really not there at all anymore. The Sarai tells me that their presence is, they'll use the word close just to help my brain think about it. Their presence is so close it no longer feels like a distant phone call. So those who are genuinely wanting to talk to them and are in contract to be the helpers, so not just talking to them out of curiosity. If you talk to them out of curiosity, you will be able to contact them. If, if you have the attitude of pure love and curiosity, you can talk to extraterrestrials, but it will be brief. It'll be like a pat on the shoulder. Hi, we love you. If you have the intent to talk to extraterrestrials because you are a helper on this earth, if that's your destiny, you will have full on conversations with them. They're available to you and they can also help you personally. There's times I'll ask Sarai about my children. What do you see about them? Can you give me some insight for the next six months? Can you just tell me what this situation is about? I just had a visit from Sarai a couple nights ago and they showed me a 3D model of how our universe is looking right now, like a summary of how's it going. I thought, I don't know what that's for, but I'm glad you told me. I didn't ask, but if you're telling me, I need to know it at some point. It was beautiful. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they describe themselves as a collective of loving extraterrestrials. Yes. That characterization raises intriguing questions in my mind about their structure and their motivations. Am I to understand them as a hive mind, a democracy, or something entirely alien or foreign to human comprehension because what do you imagine when you hear the term loving extraterrestrials how might the concept of love right. differ for an advanced civilization mm. compared to our human understanding they have access to a type of love that is so far beyond us it is incomprehensible our love here it's like we're in preschool the only beings that truly understand love here are animals, mushrooms, trees, octopus. <laughs> there are a few beings here that really get it and they're here to show us. When I work with the extraterrestrials, and we're talking about frequency again, we really are. 
the way they vibe, that type of love, it's a different ball game, different altogether. When they have been here on earth so many times to work with various governments, one of the problems is we automatically meet and say, what's your motive? What do you need from me? What do I need from you? That's not what they're about. It's this purest love. It's very hard for me to describe. And I can only feel it when I'm with them because it's not my frequency right now because I'm in a body. But when they visit me, I blend with them. It's a feeling I've never had in my life before, except when I'm with them. They are built differently. They encourage me to say loving extraterrestrials because they're wanting to be remarketed. There's been a mismarketing with extraterrestrials where aliens abduct. And some of that is true. There are some races of extraterrestrials. They have different goals. There are so many different extraterrestrial races and galaxies. Some of them have that hive mind, pure love. They'll choose one to separate, to communicate. So when I'm talking to one, they all feel it. They all get the message. And some other types of extraterrestrials, I'm an explorer and I'm from this planet. I haven't seen my kin for a long time, but if you give me this message, I can tell them telepathically. There's autonomy from some planets, all very different, depends on who you talk to. And Sarai, the collective that I work with, seem to be a core of them that are always the same, but they do bring in visitors or sometimes it feels like guest speakers from other galaxies, depending on what they need to tell me or what I'm asking. So it wouldn't be surprising if I was talking to Sarai and the Buddha was sitting with us, or there was some sort of dragon-like creature. I, I was given a moment to ask, may I introduce myself to you? Who are you? Where are you from? because they have access to the all. It's not like what we've been told. It's not from governments or entertainment. Some of the things that we have been shown, like the Stargate movie, they get excited about Mm. that. But yes, to go back to your original question, the loving extraterrestrials, that's a love that is, they do call it love. But it's something that I have, even in my near-death experiences, when I go out of body and I'm one with the God again, it's a little different from that. It's weird. It's the definition of weird, but I love it. When I first saw the word, it evokes a sense of ancient, mystical, and the cosmological. In various earth cultures, similar names held significant meaning because the name Sarai carries profound significance, particularly in the Hebrew tradition meaning princess, master, or releaser. So it's a name steeped in notions of nobility and power. I had to ask myself, what does this actually mean when beings from beyond our world adopt such a culturally loaded identifier? If I assume these loving extraterrestrials chose this name deliberately, it suggests a deep understanding of human language and culture, which raises intriguing possibilities. The question I ask myself is, are these beings ancient observers of Earth watching our civilizations rise and fall over millennia, or have they accessed global networks studying our languages and mythologies from afar because the meaning of releaser i find really thought provoking it's positioning themselves as liberators of humanity offering to release us from our current limitations i don't know i'm just trying to figure out and maybe i'm just being over analytical about it but choosing a name with roots in earth's ancient cultures is there an attempt to bridge the vast gulf between our civilizations and the bifurcated paradigms that are operating at the moment? Or is it a calculated move to make their presence feel less alien, more connected to our shared human heritage? It presents me with a paradox. It presents me what it's at once familiar and alien, comforting and unsettling, not in terms that I'm unsettled by it, But it challenges me to reconsider my place in the cosmos and the potential interplay between earthly and extraterrestrial cultures. How do you interpret the choice of the name Sarai by these loving extraterrestrials? What message do you think they might be trying to convey? Or am I being too overanalytical about it? That's a beautiful question. They're talking to me remotely. 
and I can feel it coming in through the back of my head and in to the back of my ear. So if you see me close my eyes, that's why sometimes it makes my eyes close. And they were hearing your question and they appreciate it. What I'm getting back, they're showing me the table where we sit when we have these meetings. It's like, reminds me of the Knights of the Round Table, it's this beautiful archaic room. It's a mix of ancient architecture and very modern technology. The holographs and holograms pop up in the middle of the table. There's an empty chair and they say, this belongs to the angel. We call her Sarai. She is our princess. This is our calling name. Rachel asked us when we were working with her for so long, she came to a point where she wanted to know us in such familiarity. She asked us, what do I call you? We said, we'll call you what you call us, what we call you, Sarai. That's their answer. Then they would like me to say to you, we are the same beings that took part in the creation. We have been here before the beginning of time. We have always respected your capacity to grow. And there have been many treaties formed where the leaders of human and the leaders of, they made it gesture, extra terrain, gather to decide. They're showing me mile markers in time the next course and free will is always honored. We are always available. We cannot intervene. This time is different because we have been asked by so many to intervene. We are not being asked to be the rescuers. We are being asked to collaborate. That is the difference. We will be here with you more because we are watching for the fall of your structures so we can come in to help rebuild as we did in the beginning. We know there is a concern about extraterrestrials who are not loving. We are aware there is a galactic council that creates laws. We'll use the term laws. Those are more like guidelines for us because we do not function in consequences. We are all aware of each choice and how it changes the fabric of each universe. When one party, an extraterrestrial party, does something that you will call low vibration frequency, we first wish to say we are aware it is not in collaboration with the helpers and our part is to help guard against their aims, guard against their goals. Give me a Rachel summary. Okay, so sometimes the extraterrestrials are bad guys, but they'll be around to like guard us from it. They're wonderful. Can we talk about the collective? Are you okay to do that? Oh, yes. You channel messages from what you call the collective. I've gleaned is made up of angels, guides, ascended masters, animals, and human souls. Yes. And that's a unique constellation of beings who work together to share wisdom and healing. It's interesting because in modern metaphysical research, there's a growing interest in multidimensional consciousness. There are yes. researches like Dr. Stanley Cripp and studies on consciousness by the Institute of Noetic Sciences. They've begun to take a very serious look at channeling as a legitimate phenomenon. It's always been legitimate in my mind. But your ability to connect with such a diverse group is, can I describe it as both ancient and cutting edge? <laughs> um, I suppose so. Like fashion, <laughs> yeah. it all comes back. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us more about how you first became aware of the collective? Did they come to you all at once or did they introduce themselves mm. gradually? Wow, let me go back to that. It's been so long. Gradual. It was gradual. I first began seeing the gentle spirit of people who had not crossed earthbound spirits. I saw that first. And they were the spirit of other children and animals. So I was playing with them. And then the next layer, angels. Then I started to speak with angels and they were able to define what they were. And I knew, oh, I know you guys, you're my family. <laughs> Instead of feeling the angels as a kind of beach sunlight around me, they were and are able to communicate with me as easily as you can, Peter, just right here in my atmosphere. Then the next layer were the extraterrestrials. And that began when I was four or five, they began to visit me in the night. As far as the other beings, the ascended masters, 
other galactic beings, even things that I used to believe were only in literature, unicorns, leprechauns, fairies, those beings did not begin to integrate until I had the personal belief that could be true. I didn't start working with ascended masters. I always believed in them, but I didn't believe I was worthy to talk to them. I had Jesus talking to me my whole life because I was raised Catholic. We talked about Jesus a lot. And growing up, he was always there in my catechism classes saying, that's not right. Or listen more. This is a story you'll need. But when it came to Mary Magdalene, the Buddha, I didn't even know who a lot of the other ascended masters were until I grew up because I was raised in a small town. I went to a small college. I was very narrow. When I started to explore, I was buying things like Buddhism for dummies, <laughs> meditation for dummies. I started there. As I started to open up, then they started to join the collective. And now what I find life-giving is I can close my eyes and feel the familiar sense of my grandma Walker coming in or my angels, depending on who I'm working with or as the need or desire arises, anyone can come in because I'm not scared and I'm willing if we haven't met before, then I know it's a teachable moment for me. There have been several times I'll get a name and thank God for the internet because then I can look up, oh, th wow, this was your life. That's amazing. St. Germain was one of them that came in, talks to me all the time and shows me his different forms, who he's been on this earth. Mozart comes to talk to me. I used to love to sing Mozart. So of course, Mozart comes to talk to me, he loves to tell me what he was really like. And Prince... He's an ascended master on the other side, Maya Angelou. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. So that's the, the way the collective works for me. I just show up. What a life. Are there any key messages or themes the collective most frequently share with you and through you for mm. the human race or to others? In the last three years, I've been getting messages about our food being altered and moving away from things we can control like fluoride in our toothpaste. As you spoke to so beautifully, when you go out in nature, you can connect so well. They have been showing me that as our technology increases, that will also create more of a barrier between our ability to connect with spirits. They've shown me pointers on unplugging the whole house, going off grid and feeling that ancient practice of being one with the earth being one with the moon, the sun, and the stars. They're saying mama earth and the earth experience are two different things. The earth experience continues to grow and we're here on it as spirit growing. We're not really supposed to grow with the technology. We're supposed to utilize it, but we're being taught to identify with it. And the angels are saying, the collective is saying, don't identify with anything going on earth right now. Just be the observer participate in what is for the highest good for you. Don't have the layer of fear, but be inquisitive. So going back to the food, look how labels are changing. Do a little research and then walk through the store and ask yourself, what feels and looks good to me? If sugar comes up, ask yourself, why is my body craving sugar? What is it that I need? What's not feeling loving right now? And then ask your guides, is there an alternate that would be good? I need some sweetness, but refined sugar is something that keeps us away from spirit. We can't tap into spirit if we have too much refined sugar. So a strong message I've heard from them in the past few years is to not over-identify with the earth experience. We're being told lifetime after lifetime, you're human. Go to work, clock in, clock out, produce. We're starting to pull ourselves back out of that. This human experience is going to grow really small and our experience as spirits going to go really big. They're saying that if the thousand years of peace is a really fat book, we're in the preface. We're just learning how, and we're also still dealing with the last season, the 26,000 years of wreaking havoc on the earth. That's still vibrating into the thousand years of peace. They're saying, don't over-identify with that. Learn how to be the observer and not the participant all the time. One of the most beautiful aspects of your work is introducing people to their angels and revealing the divine gifts bestowed upon their soul at creation. Angels in many spiritual traditions have served as messengers of the divine, offering guidance, offering protection, insight. And there's modern research in 
angelology, I think it's called, such yes. as the works of theologians um, like Thomas Aquinas, who emphasized yes. angels as beings of pure intellect and will. They're said to operate more on a plane that is beyond human understanding, yet deeply involved in human affairs. And as humans, we acquire knowledge gradually through a sensory experience, reasoning and learning. I would suggest angels intuitively know things in an instant. So this mm. implies that their knowledge is much more direct, complete and without error. The knowledge, well, really the wisdom they possess differs from human knowledge. When you introduce someone to their angels, what is the experience like for them? It depends on the person. It depends on their readiness to meet their angels. I find the angels often nudge me to say to them that angels are not religious. They are beings made of pure love and light. They will match the belief system of the person they're working with. Because when I introduce people to their angels, many of them don't understand that they had angels because angels respect free will. So they help in the background. That's the deal. Seeing people's faces when they know that they haven't been alone and that there is love available to them that they don't have to work for. It's not merit-based. And that's another difficult thing that comes through is I'll hear a lot of people say, do they laugh at me? They must laugh at me. I'm such an idiot. They must be so tired. Angels don't function that way. They have a great sense of humor, but they never laugh at us. They're laughing with us. They're always encouraging us. But we seem to have a lot of themes on earth, especially religious themes about God is up here. If you do these things, you'll be worthy enough. Keep going up the steps. And the angels aren't having that. The angels are saying, no, you're good right now. In any form, no matter what choices you've made, you deserve love. And that's a really interesting thing when I introduce people to their angels. The next question always is, how do I get to know them better? How do I communicate with them? The angels love that question because to them, they've been communicating with us always. It gets to be a little one-sided until we know about them. They can communicate through repeating numbers, through the animals, through other people. You can speak in someone's ear and something will come out of someone's mouth purely from an angel. Angels can even take human form for a few moments and be in the right place at the right time. Angels are not as common in some cultures, and that's an interesting concept to me because pre-life, we all choose the culture we're going to be born into. But it's really cool when we have someone, I have someone sitting in front of us and they know that I connect with angels, yet they have no idea they had them. I think this is an interesting meet cute, isn't it? Because here we are all together. It's very life-changing for people to know that angels are not always so precious. They have grit and they help and they're funny and they know everything. I was going to ask you if you had any insight to share about their nature. Do the angels that you work with share any insights about their nature? Yeah, they all have their own personality. They like to show up in a way that honors. So if we're talking about guardian angels, where you and I and every person, every living being, even every tiny flower has an angel assigned to it. So those beautiful guardian angels, they will match their person. If their person rides motorcycles, their angels are going to wear black leather. If they need a strong female presence in their life, their angels might feel more female, even though angels really aren't gendered. They show up in a way that serves us most. I want to be clear that when I say show up, using any and all of our senses. So it doesn't always have to be, I see them in the room, or I see them in my mind's eye, or I hear them. It's a feeling. It's just a knowing and that takes commitment. It takes a person saying, I'm willing for that friendship to happen. I'm willing because angels won't come if there's any fear. They will stay in the background. They'll still help. But they have that balance between our free will. So there are some things on our chart that we're destined for. And there are some things they can get in and say, turn right. It's going to save you a couple of days if you turn right. Don't eat that. <laughs> they can do those things if we invite them in. But yeah, angels tend to show up in a way that matches their person or matches the situation. So for instance, if I'm doing a house exorcism, if I'm getting rid of some oogie boogies in a house, I will notice Archangel Metatron is always there because he likes to help any beings that are not human go home. That's his passion. He's really good at that. 
Archangel Uriel is always there because Uriel takes any earthbound spirits across the veil. Depending on what else is going on in the house, I might have a Native American or an indigenous angel come through. I might have an elephant come through. You just never know. I learned not to question. Like, okay, welcome everyone. If it's something that looks, I'll say, hello there. Could you tell me why you're here today? It's never, oh no, go. This is only for the holy. Because we remember that there's no positive or negative. It's all energy. I have my helpers. If there's anything that is supposed to be removed, in comes Metatron. Metatron will say, oh, this is our client today. He's been here for a thousand years and making people sick because he's missing his family. So this is what we're going to do today. And they'll lay out the protocol. We're going to open up a portal. We're going to gather anybody who wants to cross over. We're going to do that first. And we're going to talk to this being, going to get him to get his costume off, talk to him a little bit, tell him what's up, send him back home. His family knows that he's coming home. He just needs to know that. Then it goes from being like this big demon thing to a little boy, a little teenager. It's been stuck there so long. So it depends on the situation, depends on the person. How do you differentiate between the different energies of angels and guides and other spiritual beings when you're channeling? Wow, I just know it's the same as, you know, the difference between a person and a dog, a person and a flower. You just know. Yeah, you just know. And if I don't know who they are, they'll say, I am St. Germain. But I'll know if they are an angel or an ascended master. So they make their presence. They give you an identifier in a way. Yes. From your perspective and your experience, what's the best way for someone who may feel too disconnected to begin reaching out to their angels or their divine gifts? How would they start to reach out? Nature. Go outside and say out loud or internally to your angels or source, whatever the connection is desired. You can say, I'm here to connect and I'm ready. And know there are no coincidences. Everything seen around you, everything experienced is a communication from them. Or if a ladybug lands two feet from you, that's for you. If the breeze hits you, that's a breeze from source. It's this beautiful integration of Look, we've been here all the time. We're literally the air around you. Could you sit with us so we can prove that to you? We're going to put a leaf in front of you. There's this bird that's looking at you funny. Look, here's a baby that goes by. It's going to make a funny sound. And then the integration of now you've sat with us here. Now go home and be quiet and find us at home. Listen to the sounds at home. What do you feel? Now, how about in my car? Can I feel you in my car? Can I feel you better if I have this music on or is it silence or do I need binaural beats? Can I feel you better if I wake up early and meditate at that time? Do I need a walking meditation versus a stillness meditation? This is a relationship that you're building. So you get to work it out and you can even say to your angels, when you communicate with me, I really like you to feel like you're behind me or I want you to feel like you're in front of me. Like we're having a one-on-one meeting. You can craft those things. It also seems to align with our learning style. If someone was more visual in school, they might have more success seeing spirit in their mind's eye and in the room. They were more auditory. They might hear more. That might be a good question for people to ask themselves. What what was the best way they learned? If they were more kinetic, more physical, you might try holding a yoga pose, going for a run, seeing how spirit Mm -hmm. can integrate with your thoughts. It's a relationship. You get to build a relationship Mm. that's always been there, but we forget that's part of the deal. It's easy for many of us to feel overwhelmed by our emotions and feeling disconnected. We all seem to be wired together, but are we really connected? That's Mm. a journey in itself, especially when these emotions seem to block out our connection to the divine. By going through some of these experiences, you understand these experiences from a higher perspective because the idea of emotional healing from a spiritual or divine perspective has even gained traction in psychological research. Mm -hmm. The, The studies today on spirituality and mental health shows that a faith or a belief in a higher power can significantly enhance emotional resilience and recovery. Mm -hmm. How has your connection with angels and the collective helped you navigate your health journey, your mental health journey? I like that question because an outsider looking in might think that I'm mentally unwell. 
because I talk to all these beings and I'm always channeling. In fact, the truth is engaging with spirit, going right to source has given me the most clarity and it's still coming to me. It's still developing. It's given me peace, peace. When I was in the throes of depression, and I still have depression, I consider depression now to be a message. When I experience depression, I'll ask her, why are you here? Or anxiety, what's your purpose? But I don't say I have depression. I'll lightly personify it and say, what's your message? Or I'll ask the angels. But what the spirit connection has done for me is it's allowed me to vibrate higher. I found peace. I'm going to say that to find the vibration of peace, because when I was really down, I thought what I wanted was happiness. I was always pushing for happy. I want to be happy. What I was really desiring was peace. The connection with spirit brought me peace because the way I found it was first, I thought my meditation, I thought I can't meditate. My, my brain is too fast. I can't meditate. So I'm going to meditate while I wash the dishes. It didn't work so well. It was great self-care, but I wasn't really connecting. It wasn't until I committed to being still. And letting my body know I was safe to be still, that it was a choice I was making. I didn't feel guilty. I could say to myself, this is the thing I'm doing right now. No one needs me right now. It's okay for me to be in this space for 20 minutes, an hour, or to take a delightful nap and let spirit talk to me in my dreams. When I made that commitment, peace started to happen because I started to be able to feel them and hear them back. We're taught how to pray outward but not as much how to listen. The stillness helped me grow the ability to listen. When I could listen, I started to ask them questions. How do I bring peace into my life? How do I end this thing that's going on because it doesn't serve me anymore? How, how do I navigate that? And I began to get the messages in return. It's life-changing. Mental health is still part of my fabric in my human brain, but it's not the same animal as it was because of my connection with spirit. Thank God. That's beautiful. It allows you to embrace and engender peaceful chemistry. When you have peaceful chemistry, truth from source can give you peaceful chemistry, which enables and empowers you to have peace of mind. When depression comes in, you bring it to a standstill rather than letting it run its course. Then you can say, okay, I'm lacking buoyancy right now. It's like if you haven't got air in your tires when you're driving a car, you haven't got Don't keep driving the car. Yeah. Don't keep driving the car because you're going to put a strain on the motor and you're not going to get very far. Right. You know, blow up a balloon and put a smiley face on it and put it on a plinth by your bedside. I guarantee you after a few days, it'll go from this to this because there's lack of compression. You haven't brought yes. it to a standstill. You haven't allowed it say what is the message here what resources do i need to be able to respond to this then you perceive it more as a challenge and maybe that challenge is surrender as distinct from a threat if it's a it's threat you, you may not have the resources to manage that and that builds internal pressure and that internal pressure has got to go somewhere that doesn't mm -hmm. give you peaceful chemistry it doesn't give you peace of mind it's, it's chaos and inertia. Yes, it's surviving. It also allowed me to work through things in my personality that I didn't want anymore. I didn't want to be the person who couldn't lose. I didn't want to be the person who couldn't be wrong. I had a lot of ego stuff going on. And I knew it wasn't always all mine. I knew some of it was from my childhood, but also I was done caring about that. I didn't care where it came from. I thought I have it now. It's getting in the way of my life. And finding that peace allowed me to see those parts of me without judgment and to see them as, mm. okay, I can love all of me, literally love all of me. The thing that surprises me the most is I didn't know when I was growing in that way. The angels have shown me, they make it look like sound waves. But when we grow, even if it's just for a moment, the consciousness grows so much. I didn't know that. I'm glad I didn't know it when I was going through it because it would have put pressure on me. I asked them, is that because I'm an angel? And they said, no, it's because you chose to be human. And this is the human experience. You all find your highest level of frequency minus peace and love. When you click into that, even the thought of wanting to do better begins to heal the fabric of the universe. Any tears begins to heal it, heals the matrix.
Can the collective offer any insights into the nature of human emotions and how they're perceived from a higher divine perspective? Sure. I've been working with the Anunnaki quite a bit lately. And the Anunnaki are fascinating to work with because they are unraveling some choices they made in our beginnings where they created a human race to be slaves. Now they can recognize that slavery is still happening. They never meant to be slave drivers. They just didn't understand that when they created the human race, we would become autonomous. We would be beings of love. They really thought we would be more animal-like. They also underestimated animals. When humans started to create their own families and ideas and democracies, the Anunnaki started to pull back and say, let's just see how this experiment goes. Human slavery didn't happen after that from them, but it continued to happen here and different levels of slavery between people owning people, but also guilt, shame, that version of slavery. And they're saying we're still in it and people putting each other in debt for things that we shouldn't be doing, healthcare, putting people in financial peril because they're sick, that's slavery. The Anunnaki are saying, we take ownership in what we started. This idea of slavery is from us, and we are here to help unravel and re-sew the matrix. That feels like everything we've talked about, all the good work. I want to ask them now, what is their specific part, and how did they show up for us? And they're saying, because we have a part in your creation, we can integrate in your thoughts at any time in any being, we have the permission to begin redirecting and we are beginning to alchemize hate into love. That's what the Anunnaki are doing. We're alchemizing hate into love. It's time. We were creating help for ourselves and our mistake was creating a system where there were lower beings to serve us instead of collaborating with each other to create a structure of help within help. Since we've created you beautifully, we'll stay with you. We've always been with you. And then they went quiet. Okay. <laughs> I guess that was it. <laughs> Rachel, the insights you share from the collective are deeply healing and inspiring. And I know you have channeled, amplified some of the collective's wisdom, but I'd love to offer our listeners the chance to experience that connection firsthand. If you're willing, I'd like to invite you to open yourself up to the collective and channel any messages or wisdom they might have for us in this 21st century. I see the human race has run its mile and I'm looking at the safety, security, welfare and upgrade of the human race, not only for today, but for those yet to come and what our world may look like as we move into this new phase, this new elevation, this new time. I would love to do that with pleasure. Let me just feel who's coming in. I'm a conscious channel, so I'll be fully present as this happens. Sometimes I look to the side when I'm channeling. I have Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary here, and they are holding. Could I zoom in on that, please? It's a sphere. Okay, hold that thought. And then I I have Jesus there. Then I have a representative from the Anunnaki. I have Sarai at my back in a half circle. I have Saint Germain above me and Archangel Gabriel. Who is going to be the speaker today? Who will speak through me? I am Mother Mary. We've prepared this message and we wish to speak and it'll be my voice. Oh, it's Mary Magdalene. She's coming back in. It'll be Mary Magdalene. Got it. All right, here we go. This is channeled from Mary Magdalene. Ah, my friends, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to begin today by saying I've known you for so long, and I'm so grateful for those that remember me the way I am. I am your friend, Mary. I've always been here to help, and I want to start first in gratitude, saying thank you for those of you who are talking to me. I am bringing back the divine feminine, as you like to call it on earth, because the survival is coming to an end, and the creation is coming back. We have shown Rachel today that our two speakers today are the Marys, myself, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, mother of Jesus. I'm going to start by saying the matrix you live in is such a beautiful texture of fabric. I watch it weave and grow every day. As I look upon this tapestry, there are threads pointing upward. Those threads are unfinished tasks 
been left open purposefully throughout the generations. Those of you listening to this message, you're hearing this on purpose because you have something to do with those strings, those tasks. These are the same tasks that are part of your purpose, why you are here on earth. If you wonder what your purpose might be, ask yourself, what is it that brings you the ability to be peaceful in your spirit, in your physical body? And is it in alignment with how you spend your time? We wish this for you. And we tell you that in the years to come on earth, we see all of you living into your divine purpose. You do not need to know exactly what this is right now, but we ask you to begin feeling for it. You will know when it is not your purpose because you will not identify with it. Your body will also rebel. If you are listening to this and you are in a profession and you are sick in the body or sick in your mind, it is because we are telling you to blossom like a rose. Mary Magdalene, am incarnate on earth right now. I take many forms. I am in all parts of the earth and I am helping. She steps aside and Mother Mary comes in. My, you are all wonderful for listening. And if I have a personal message to share, it would be, I appreciate so much that the channel Rachel feels the need to tell people that I am not just Catholic. I will start with that today. So all of you listening, I want you to know that I am a mother to all of you. I wish to tell you that when I hold this sphere, it is a representation of your earth. And I'm holding your earth strongly in my hand. And I have it here. This is what you are calling the new earth. It is already ready and available for you. The timeline is open. The earth that you are treading on right now is beginning to crumble, but not into death. It is simply crumbling because this sphere is coming from the middle. It's becoming born. And on this sphere, you will find peace, collaboration, systems like bartering. You will find a new system where everyone can be their own sovereign being. Rolling the ball in her hand. Reminds me of that, Rachel speaking, the movie Labyrinth. When they would move the ball, she's doing that. Saint Germain comes in. He's speaking in my left ear. Mary, tell them to watch for, I'm going to put my hand down, Mary. Mary, tell them to watch for all of the masters in body. Tell them, please, that we are not helping from somewhere far away. We have our feet on the ground, and we are confident that this time, free will and love will marry together. Gabriel comes in, Archangel Gabriel. Peter, I thank you, my brother, for doing this work. Gratitude. Peter, do you have anything you wish to ask this collective? My real concern is for those yet to come and for the success and furtherance of humanity and its elevation and upgrade. It's not really a question, it's a statement more than anything. He's bringing in Archangel Azrael to speak with you. His voice is low, bass. This is a thought worth having. We understand your intent a projected timeline. Know me as the angel of death because your world is dying. And I do not wish to be an alarmist, but I feel I am speaking what you already know. There is no God that is killing your earth. It is the humans. I am called in because with this death, the death can be permanent, end of earth, but so many are choosing to end earth and regrow. Mary holds up the sphere. This is what has been growing inside Mother Earth, the new way. The Azrael. Yes, where there is destruction, this is when we encourage people and not participate. Be the helper. Extend love, partnership, share your resources. There will be dark times on Earth, and we feel this is known by all. We cannot change a message. This is the outcome. Because change is something that you have all chosen to work hard for, and you are rewriting the course of Earth. And in order to rewrite this course, there will be many changes, big death and mini death. In regards to the future generation, there are populations of souls eager to be born on Earth, and they are waiting until the right moment, which is why so many are experiencing infertility. This will happen. 
this new generation will be here when it is time. Some have already arrived. We are also here, I am here in particular, to help the angels that work with me escort those who are not willing to be part of the Great Awakening. They will be crossing over. They will be part of the exodus, part of the death. This is not a rapture. This is not the book of Revelations. This is a free will choice, and it is good. It will be a challenge for humankind because we notice when there is something negative, perceived negative, it can breed more negativity. So we ask the light workers to observe what is happening and alchemize it with love. War, I see war. As war happens, there will be death. But this war is not a fight for something better. It is actually the ending of the 26,000 years of survival. It is making way for peace to reign. And then he steps back. I'm touched, moved, and inspired by that message. I feel very emotional. I don't know why. A lot of images came through when he was channeling. They're still here, but they're allowing me to share the images. I saw people in big cities no longer walking to work, but walking to food lines, walking to get water. It did not look as desperate as it sounds. It looked like organized chaos. People were helping other people. I saw a big pile of clothing that people were giving out clothing. Everyone had their windows open. It looks like there's no power. Asriel's coming back in. Yes, prepare for the time of darkness. Prepare for the time of darkness. As you have spoken about earlier in your conversation, there is much to be had when you are disconnected from your earthly tethers. You will experience a time of darkness where you cannot get online. You cannot turn your lights on. It will be what you speak of off. And he shows me a giant light switch off. Let this happen. When the sun comes back on, you will experience a chance for renewal. There will be much confusion. Be wary of the false prophets who say this is the only way because you are designed to find your own way. Go within and find your way to peace. You can gather together and find your, your spirit family. It's encouraged, but no longer will you find he's showing me a charismatic church where the methodology the theology is unworthiness. When the sun comes back on, you will know I am here because I am here. I'm here because I'm supposed to be, and I am worthy. Saint Germain is coming through as a scientist saying the sun is already different. There will be a third sun coming through, and the third sun is coming through because the one there now is manufactured, and spirit is creating the new sun, S-U-N, the new sun, that will be turned on after the three days of darkness. Azrael says, this will not feel good for everyone. If you are on a spiritual path, you will be fine. Those who aren't, they are also fine. It is their path. Just because it is not easy doesn't mean that it is wrong. Then the picture he showed me with that big statement was, I saw people who were trying to start a revolution. This is, we're trying to still fight and it just won't go anywhere people won't have it. We're not doing that anymore. Stop. We're not doing that anymore. And those things will happen, but they'll fizzle out. It is just not the way. The biggest complainers will be objectors, will be those who are currently holding up the systems. So when the government is falling in various countries, there will be some pushback that will be difficult to deal with. Remember, love wins. Love and truth win. It is a frequency. It is science. St. Germain says, it's science. Oh, he's got Albert Einstein with him. I've been called in to help. I'm using what I call wacky science. You are vacillating between what you believe to be positive and negative. It is a sporadic dance of the lovely and the divine. When it goes too much into the darkness, I alchemize with you. It is wacky, he said. His eyes are like this, wacky. Thank you so much. I think it was Einstein who said, frequency will be the medicine of the future. Oh, ah, he's in it right now. He's working on it. I noticed something interesting too, that I was watching children in that line and they were playing 
it looked like some telepathic communication between a couple of them. They're coming in so differently. And the adults waiting in line for food, it was joyful. It was like, oh, okay, what are we eating today? And everyone was picnicking, sitting together. It, it's not when COVID struck and, and people were waiting in line for food for survival. This was the new way. I saw tables, it looked like a farmer's market. People were trading. Someone like me, I would be able to help people communicate with angels for loaves of bread, for hugs. We're really moving into that. It'll be beautiful. I'm asking them timeline and they say that is up to us. It is happening no matter what. And their thought is, here's Mother Mary coming back in. She's got that sphere again. She says, not long. And she's showing me a wall calendar that has all the years. Like you might find it in an old gas station or something. She's pointing to, we'll feel it in 2029, 2030. That will be the time we're ramping up to it. Then when she said 2030, I saw Sarai light up like, oh, that's our year. So I don't know what that's about, but I just saw like, almost like high five each other. That's our year. I don't know what that meant for them, but they got excited. It all corresponds to the astrology that is on setting. There's a difference between something on setting and something actualizing, but the onset has started. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to you and to the collective and to Sarai for the openness, the willingness to engage with these questions during this dialogue and your ability to speak so freely about your experiences and insights while also remaining open to thoughtful inquiry is truly admirable for me. I appreciate the grace with which you've shared your journey and the profound spiritual insights you've gained along the way. It's clear to me that your work touches, moves and inspires the lives of many. Your openness in exploring different perspectives is a testament to the depth of your wisdom and compassion, because it's not easy to navigate the space between truth and critical thought, yet you do so with both elegance and authenticity. So thank you so much for your generosity and to the generosity of the collective and for your time and for bringing in such a beautiful spirit into this discussion. It's been an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to learn from you and to explore these fascinating topics together. Your message will continue to inspire and uplift anyone who encounters it. So mm, thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. It's such a blessing to talk with you. For people who want to find out more about the work that you do, where do they need to go? You can always find me in the spirit realm. You can always close your eyes and wish to speak to me. I'll find you there always. If you're wanting something more human, <laughs> rachelcorpus.com is my website. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I never remember what those are, but search it. You'll find me. <laughs> I really love to give people sessions to connect with their guides and their angels. Sometimes on my website, you'll see classes available. I help you remember. I work with the angels. The classes are fully channeled. So it depends on who signs up. That affects the content. If that speaks to you. There's also something called mindset luminary that the angels came up with. And that's for people who are really wanting to dig into their spirituality, but they also feel like they want a partner in that. It's like coaching, but it's all in the spiritual realm. And we can navigate through any part of your life that you wish, but it's also with me and your angels. And that's all on my website. Thank you for asking me that question because it brings me all the joy in the world to work with people. Love it. I love it. And that's why I'm here to help people remember that they're not separate from source and that they can create a beautiful life. So yeah, rachelcorpus.com. Oh, and my podcast is Angel Talk. And you can find that on any platform, or you can go to the network I work for, which is Mind Body Spirit FM. That's a really interesting show because when I started it, I wasn't telling people yet that I was an angel incarnate. I was just doing regular podcasts about spiritual stuff. In the last couple of months, I've been more outward about my angelic self. If you listen from the beginning, you'll get a scope of my growth from the last couple of years. It's pretty neat. And you'll get to hear things like how my house is haunted and episodes <laughs> where my daughter channels. It's a neat thing. I wish 
that every conversation could be as delightful and deep as this one. And I'm so grateful. I feel that when you come up with questions, they are, the questions are a blend of you and spirit. You're a beautiful channel of yourself that's felt so deeply. I appreciate that. I love what a great listener you are. You really listen with your whole self and your whole heart. And that feels so good. And I appreciate how that is resonating out into the universe because we're all trying to listen better. And I just thank you for that. I feel so seen and loved and heard today. It's been wonderful. Thank you. You're most welcome. When you look at the word listen, it's let's in or silence by anagram. Wow. There you go. So you let me in. We could all do a bit more of that. 